So let's take a few moments to review some of the things we've seen in Scheme, specifically writing procedures, working with conditional statements, and some recursion examples. So remember, we can define a name to be a value. And so now when we evaluate x, it evaluates to the value 10. Now, if we define a form like this, now x evaluates to 10, and increment evaluates to a procedure. So if we say increment 3, it returns 4. So even though x is defined here, this value of x has local scope. Notice we're defining it here. So you can define functions this way, although I prefer not to because it's sort of hiding what's going on behind the scenes. If I say lambda x plus x1 and then pass that to value 3, when I run this code, notice this line evaluates to 4 because, again, this x has local scope and then it's bound to the value 3. Now, a better way to do this is to define a function called increment lambda to be a lambda procedure that takes one parameter x and returns plus x1. Now, if I say increment x or increment 3 or increment lambda x or increment lambda 3, now when I run this code, you'll see that they both perform the same way. But again, this x has global scope, but the x's that are declared inside the procedures have local scope. And you can always see what scope the variable has by hovering the mouse over the name. And just as a reminder, here this lambda is an unnamed procedure. And here we are using define to associate a name to an unnamed procedure. So that unnamed procedure gets the name increment. We're naming the unnamed procedure. And that allows us to use it later. Now I can define a procedure called do. And we're going to create a lambda that takes two parameters, this and that. And it's going to do this to that. So here, notice these both have local scope. So if I say do increment plus 3 in x, then when I run this, you'll see that it evaluates 3 plus x to be 13, and then it increments that. And I could also say do lambda x, let's say times x2 to x. And in this case, we get 20. And if I do the same thing with 3, it'll return 6, because again, this is an unnamed procedure that multiplies a parameter by 2. Again, x has local scope, and so I'm doing it, in this case, to x, the global scoped x. In this case, I'm doing it to 3. Now, of course, do is sort of a useless procedure here because all it does is take some operation and apply it to some parameter. So here, I'm performing the operation increment on the result of evaluating 3 plus x. Here, I'm applying this unnamed procedure to the value that x evaluates to, which since I defined x to be 10, is 10. And I can write multi-conditional procedures. And so in this case, I'm going to define something called day of the week. And that's going to take one parameter. And that parameter is going to be a symbol. So for example, I'm going to want to say day of the week, Sunday, and I want it to return one because Sunday is the first day of the week. Or day of the week, Friday, and then I would expect that to return five because Friday is the fifth day of the week. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to set up a conditional statement. And I'm going to say if Sunday is equal to the parameter, I'm going to return 1. And I'm going to continue this for each day of the week. And if the parameter is not a day of the week, I'll just return 0. And it looks like I'm missing my question mark here. So let me add those. So we run this, and we can see that it returns 1 and 6. Now what if I define Thursday to be 10, then Thursday will evaluate to 10. So what happens if I say day of the week Thursday? Notice here, it's going to return 0, because this is not a symbol. This is a name that evaluates to 10. So let's say I define Wednesday to be the symbol Wednesday. So now if I say day of the week, Wednesday, now that returns a value. So notice what's going on here. Here I'm passing in a name that evaluates to 10, which is not a valid day of the week. So if I want to use this, I have to pass in a symbol. And likewise, if I do these defines, this name 
is not the symbol Thursday, it's a name. So if I want to calculate a letter grade, I'm going to take a single parameter n, and the conditions are going to be, if the parameter is greater than or equal to 900, then I'll return a. And notice I'm returning a symbol here, not a name. If I just said a without the quote, then this wouldn't work because a doesn't evaluate to anything. So if I say grade 100 or grade 899 or grade, let's say the grade is 8, 810, but the final grade is 91. So let's see what that evaluates to. And we can see the letter grades. We've already done a lot of recursion in Scheme. So just as a reminder of how powerful recursion can be, let's look at the Towers of Hanoi. So the Towers of Hanoi problem, if you're not familiar with it, is a game where there's three pegs and there's disks of different sizes that are placed on the pegs. And the goal is to move all the disks from one peg to another, so in this case it'll be from A to C, one at a time without putting a larger disk on top of a smaller disk. And there's a recursive solution there. So if we want to move n disks from peg A to peg C, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to move n minus 1 pegs from peg A to peg B. That's the middle peg. We'll think of it as the temp peg. And then we move one disk from our starting peg A to our goal peg C. And then we move the n minus 1 disks that are on peg B to peg C. And this is recursive. So when we were moving the n minus 1 disks, of course, we could follow the same procedure. We would just switch what our goal and our temp peg was. So we'll write a function that will create a list that has the directions for how to solve this. So we're going to have four parameters. The first is how many disks we're going to move, then a parameter for each peg, the starting peg, the temp peg, and then the destination peg. So if n is equal to 1, so this is our base case, then we're going to make a list of one direction, which is going to be move from source to destination. This actually should just be a symbol, not a list, because we want to make a list that tells us to move from the source to the destination. Otherwise, we're going to make a list of what we need to do to move n minus 1 disks from the source to the temp disk using the destination as our temp disk. Then we're going to move one disk from the source. Here, it doesn't matter what we use as the temp peg because the temp peg isn't used in the base case and we'll move the disk from the source to the destination. And then finally, we're going to move n minus one disks from the temp peg using the source peg, which is now empty, and we're going to move it to the destination. And that will be sufficient code to solve this. Let's say we have three disks, and we'll call them red, yellow, and blue. When we run this, we'll get a list of directions of how to move all the disks from the red peg to the blue peg. And we should probably say red peg, yellow peg, and blue peg, just so we don't get confused and move that color disk. Probably a better way to do this, we could say Hanoi 4, and we'll go from A, using B as our temp peg, to peg C. In fact, again, I think it's better just to say peg A, B, C, just to be clear. So when I run this, you can see I get the directions to move four disks from peg A to peg C. We could write code to interpret this list and move a robot hand or, or something like that. And another bug I see, our grade doesn't look correct. Yeah, everybody gets an A. That's not good. So I think here we want to add N for the grade. So now if I run this, the grades are correct. 100 is an F, 899 is a B, and 810 plus 91 is an A. And let me go back through here as well and just add some comments as far as like what we're doing. So here we talked about names and scope. Here we define some procedures. So let's run this, make sure everything looks good. Our output looks good. We're getting correct output this time. I think that that's overall pretty good.